we are talking about uh, probabilistic reasoning and we will first have a, a short introduction or let's say a review of what we need from probability theory. Um, we, we started with this introductory example of the flying penguin um, and if we do it with classical logic then we have the problem that from these uh, three propositions we can derive um, that uh, Tweety can fly. So Tweety is a penguin and penguins are birds and all birds can fly and so obviously we can derive that Tweety can fly. We can also do this formally using um, for example the modus ponens um, uh, rule so what's going on here? Okay. Um, yes, we could do this formally too and we could uh, derive that Tweety can fly. Even though um, I mean this is, this is not what we would expect because we know that penguins cannot fly. So, uh, so then we add uh, another rule saying penguins cannot fly. Of course we have to add this rule because otherwise our knowledge base doesn't know it. Yeah? Uh, okay, but if we, when we add this rule then we can of course derive not fly uh, of Tweety which means Tweety cannot fly. But the old conclusion that Tweety can fly can still be derived. I mean this is what um, this is due to the property of first order logic which is called monotonicity. So um, everything we, I can derive before I, I still can derive it after I add this new rule. So now we have a contradiction our knowledge is now inconsistent. This is the problem. Huh? And oh, what's going on here now today? Okay, uh, sorry. The knowledge is now inconsistent um, and there is no easy way to solve this problem using classical logic. Um, but if we use probabilistic logic um, then we can, we, can, uh, we can tell the truth which is for example 99% or maybe even more of all birds can fly. Um, and if we, if we use this then we, we will later see that the problem uh, can easily be solved. Um, yes, okay. So what, what, this, what this image tells us is that um, in real life sometimes we have to reason with, uh, with limited knowledge. I mean this, is, this guy should really take a real time decision and not wait too long uh, until he decides what to do. And uh, so if I have limited, for example, time resources, then of course uh, I don't know everything. I cannot uh, do the whole reasoning. So I have to do reasoning under limited resources, which is very important in applications. Now let's go into another example where we can, uh, which is very, um, they are very well suited for probabilistic reasoning and we also see the problems we have with classical logic. This is a um, classical logic formulation of a rule with respect to a diagnosis of appendicitis. Yeah? So if the patient has uh, stomach pain in the right lower part of the abdomen and the leukocyte value is bigger than 10,000 then the patient has appendicitis which obviously this is not a true statement 
because this is not the case all the time. Maybe with high probability this is true, huh? but now this is no longer um, a logical statement, it's a probabilistic statement. Huh? And that's what we, what we will do in this chapter. So we will, we will start with a probabilistic formulation of uh, our knowledge. Huh? Okay. Um, one early example of an expert system where they used uh, a mechanism to formulate uncertainty. So they, uh, they did not use logic anymore. They developed their own formalism in this expert system called Mycin. This was in 1976 and the inventors were Shortliff and Buchanan and they used so-called certainty factors to represent the certainty of facts and rules. Yeah? So, like in the treaty example, we, we could say something like, with very high certainty, uh, birds can fly, but not absolutely sure. Yeah? So that was the idea to overcome these, uh, this problem. And uh, so the syntactical notion of rules is like, I have an, a rule if A then B, but, uh, uh, but this is, rule is only true with a certain, <laughs> with a certainty. Actually this is, yeah, uh, this is actually not true. It's not a conditional probability, it's a certainty. Uh, um, okay, now th this, our appendicitis rule, may now look like that. So I have on this arrow a 0.6, which means the certainty of this rule is 0.6. It's not 1, it is 0.6. Uh, um, and now the question is, if I know the patient has the stomach pain right lower and leukocyte value is bigger than 10,000, how could I then apply this rule with the 0.6 here? In classical logic, I would just apply the rule and conclude, okay, now the patient has appendicitis. But what does that mean here? Um, with, with this uh, arrow here, with the 0.6, how can we apply such a rule? So we need a, a calculus, we need formulas for connecting such rules. Yeah? But it turns out that this calculus is incorrect. The calculus they developed, I don't uh, present how it works, but I just tell you that this calculus is incorrect. It uh, delivers inconsistent results uh, when applying the rules. So this is not really uh, what we will be using. We will be using uh, a probabilistic calculus which is nowadays uh, what everybody uses. But this, I mean, this was the first attempt to put uncertainty into the calculus. Okay, um, other formalisms have been developed for dealing with this problem we have seen uh, in the treaty example. I mean, we have a problem with classical logic. How can we solve this problem? Um, so many logicians developed different uh, kinds of non-monotonic logics. I already said the problem is monotonicity. I add additional no new knowledge, but still all the old conclusions can still be derived. That's what we call monotonicity. And what we want is a non-monotonic logic. So logicians worked on non-monotonic logics. One example is Default logic, this is a special type of non-monotonic logic called default logic. Why default logic? I mean, this is very easy to understand. Take the treaty example. Uh, the, the original rules, let's go back. Um, yeah, these rules, they're all called, they're all default rules. So the default for a bird is that it can fly. That's the default. But uh, there is this 
kind of exception from the default, if it's a penguin, then it cannot fly. And now in default logic, uh, such a non-default rule overrides the default. Huh? So um, if I would use default logic, then I could only derive that VT cannot fly because it's a penguin and because this is not a default rule. For all others which are not penguins, they of course can fly. So that's what default logic did, but uh, still um, there are some inconsistencies and se severe problems with default logic. That's why this was not really successful. Huh? Then there was a quite successful theory, which is Dempster-Schäfer uh, theory. They assigned a belief function to any logical propositions. So this is with reasoning about belief huh? and uh, um, a calculus to deal with these beliefs. Uh, this is quite a nice uh, theory, but it turned out that what we will do, which is probabilistic logic, is even better. No? Then another uh, quite uh, successful approach was fuzzy logic, um, which was developed in the late 80s. Um, and maybe you have seen that there, are, there were in the past many applications of fuzzy logic. You could even uh, buy washing machines with the label fuzzy logic on the front and so there, there was some chip with a built-in fuzzy logic to control the machine of uh, uh, photo cameras uh, working with fuzzy logic and so on. <coughs> but nowadays fuzzy logic is no more that popular um, just because there also have been formal problems. Um, so in contrast to probabilistic logic, fuzzy logic uh, does not have a well-founded semantics. So the meaning of a fuzzy logic statement is not absolutely clearly defined, uh, but in probabilistic logic this is really very nice. Huh? Okay, uh, so what we will do now in the following is we will do reasoning with conditional probabilities. Huh? Um, so we will use conditional probabilities instead of logical implications. So let's, let's look at an example or a, a formula. So in logic, in, in propositional logic, we would write something like A implies B, uh, which means if A is true, then B is true. Huh? And uh, the semantics of such a statement is defined by a truth table. You all know this. Huh? Okay, um, but as soon as this proposition A is not uh, a hard logical proposition, which means, uh, I mean in logic A is either true or false, but now if we say something like the probability for A is something like 0.3, then you can't apply this anymore. Huh? Uh, now, what we then do is we will use conditional probabilities, uh, probability for B under the condition of A. Huh? So this means, uh, so and if I say this is 0.6, um, so that means under all the events where A is true, the probability for B is 60%. Huh? So in 60% of the cases B is true if A is, A is true. That's what, what the conditional probability means. But we will go into this uh, now a little more formally. So uh, yeah, we will also use uh, subjective probabilities. This is a step away from classical mathematics. A strong mathematician, uh, if you do probability theory, would tell you, okay, so if you don't know the probabilities, then you, I cannot tell you anything and you will do nothing. I mean, that, but I mean, that's the problem of mathematics. I mean, mathematics is not real life. 
I already told you last time, if you stand in the middle of the street and it's a dangerous situation, then you have to do something, even though you, do, you know nothing. If you know nothing, maybe it's better to just run off the street in, in some direction. Huh? But the strong mathematicians, a, statist, a statistics person, would tell you, okay, as long as you don't know the probabilities, I can't tell you anything, so you don't do anything. Yeah? But, um, I mean, here in AI, of course, we have to take a decision. So we even will take decisions if we do not know the probabilities. Yeah? And, and that's what we then call subjective probabilities. So we assume, if I know nothing, uh, for example, whether to go to the right direction of the street or the left, uh, right side or left side of the street, if I know nothing, then the probability to run in either direction is 0.5. So I assume, even if I don't know, I assume that both probabilities are the same and I will uh, take my decision based on this uncertain knowledge. And that's what we call subjective probabilities because maybe they are not true. They are subjective to me. So I assume uh, these values. That's very important. Huh? Um, okay, and very important also is that probability theory is a well-founded theory which is centuries old. Um, so uh, a lot of work has been invested in this theory. Um, and well-founded also means it is based on the frequency assumption. So if I, for example, tell you that out of all the patients that enter a, a clinic um, with the hypothesis that they may, be, may have appendicitis, if I tell you that uh, the probability that these persons have appendicitis is 0.6, then this is based on frequencies. So that means, what does that mean? Out of 100 patients, how many would then have appendicitis? appendicitis? How many? 60. 60, yeah. And that's the frequency semantics. The, so the frequency out of these 100 patients, 60 have appendicitis. So this is a very simple, basic, well-founded semantics of a probability proposition. Huh? Um, and everybody can understand this. Okay, we will do reasoning with uncertain and incomplete knowledge. We will start with the maximum entropy method, which is pretty uncommon. So in, in most AI books, they would not start with this. They would maybe start with Bayesian networks. But I start with the Maxent met method because this is, and it can be proven, this is the optimal method to deal with uncertainty. And it's a very nice uh, tool, so you really will understand what's going on if, for example, we have incomplete knowledge or uncertain knowledge. Okay, so now let's start with a simple uh, basic introduction to probabilities. Huh? Um, so now let's start with this definition. Um, we will talk about a set of experiments and let omega be the set of possible outcomes of one given experiment. For example, throwing a dice and uh, the six possible outcomes of throwing a dice are the, the numbers one to six. Yeah? So this would then be omega. Each uh, lowercase omega in omega stands for a possible outcome of the experiment. So these Omega, if the omega i in omega exclude each other but cover all possible outcomes, they are called elementary events. And this is the case uh, for the dice. It is not possible if you roll the dice that you have a 1 and a 2 at the same time. So they exclude each other. Huh? Um, yeah. So our omega is this. Throwing an even number is this subset out of omega. 
And this, this event, I mean, I can call this e an event uh, getting an even number. This e event, of course, is not an elementary event because it contains three elementary events. So it's the union of three elementary events. Or throwing a number smaller than five is not an elementary event either. Um, yeah, and, and I mean we can do some reasoning. We take uh, all the even uh, numbers and the numbers uh, uh, less than or equal to four. And now um, if we have this event and this event at the same time is the intersection of these three sets which is not uh, which is not the empty set and so you can see that these these two events are not elementary events because the intersection is not empty okay um, so if I have two events A and B, then the union of these uh, events is an event. Omega is the sure event. Look, this is the sure event. Why? Because um, if I throw my die, um, this event is always true. I mean, I always have one out of these uh, six numbers. The empty set is the impossible event because in the die, dice example, each time I throw the die, um, I have one of these numbers, one to six. So it, it, it may not happen that I get an empty set. Okay, yes, uh, this is about notion. Uh, instead of uh, writing A intersect B, um, we write A and B and the semantics of A and B is defined by this. So if X is in the intersection of A and B, this is equivalent to X is in A and X is in B. So there is this duality between set theory and logic. Okay. Um, some more notions about this duality. This is the intersection. This is the union, and uh, which is uh, dual to the OR. And then I have uh, the the complement of a set, which corresponds to logical negation. Then um, the sure event omega. Uh, this corresponds to true in propositional logic. Oh, this would actually be a T not a, a W. Let me see, uh, is this in the book too? Who has the book? Oh yes, this is an, an, a fault in the book too. It should be a T. Like true and false. In the following, we will only uh, work with discrete random variables with a finite value range because then the whole theory is easier. We can, of course, do it with continuous variables too, but we will only talk about discrete var variables. Um, okay. And now, for example, the probability to throw a 5 or a 6 is one third. And we will write this like P of a number is in 5, 6, so this means, this means the probability for this event is the probability of throwing a 5 or throwing a 6, which is one third. Okay, um, now, uh, now we define formally the notion of probability. This is what is called 
the Laplace definition of, of probability, which is a very simple and basic definition. Um, and it is, it is appropriate here because we are talking about finite discrete events. As soon as we go into continuous variables, then um, this definition can no longer be used. Why? Because then in the denominator we would have an infinite which doesn't make sense. So then uh, this formula is no longer defined. But as long as we talk about finite sets of events, we can use this formula which is very easy and easy to understand. So if omega is finite, um, then we assume that no elementary event is preferred. That means all elementary events do have the same statistical weight. So for example in the dice game, um, the numbers 1 up to 6, they all come with the same probability. Uh, so we assume that this is the case for elementary events. Um, so we assume a symmetry regarding the frequency of occurrence of all elementary events. The probability P of A of the event A is then defined by, um, by this ratio here, which is the size of the set A divided by the size of omega. Uh, and the size of A is the number of outcomes in favor of A divided by the number of all possible outcomes. So in case of, look at this example, uh, the probability to throw an even number is the size of the set of even numbers divided by the size of all numbers, which is uh, 3 over 6, and that's 1 half. Okay, I already talked about the Laplace assumption um, only for finite event sets. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, let, let's look at this. I mean, uh, we, we sometimes use this shorthand. Uh, instead, in, in case of Boolean variables, which may only have the values true and false, and suppose John calls is a Boolean variable, then it would be correct to write probability of John calls is equal to true. Uh, then we just can abbreviate this and say probability for John calls. Okay, yeah. And uh, a simple conclusion from our Laplacian definition of probability are these seven propositions. So the probability for omega is equal to 1. And it's, uh, it's an exercise for you to prove all these. I mean, it's very simple. For example, this, you should, you should immediately see the proof of this because it's trivial. Huh? The, the probability uh, for the empty event is zero. Uh, this is obvious too. And now some of these are a little bit more work, but it's, it's really, it's a nice exercise to do this. For pairwise inconsistent events A and B, we have P of A or B is equal to P of A plus P of B. But this is very, it's very important, this is only true for inconsistent events. Um, yeah, look here at this uh, proposition number five. Um, this is the same, P of A or B is P of A plus P of B minus P of A and B. So this is actually the true formula and for the special case of pairwise inconsistent events, we can just omit this intersection. <coughs> okay, and for two complementary events, uh, P of A plus P of uh, negative A is equal to 1. Yeah. Now what, what else? Uh, if A is a subset of B, then we have P of A less than or equal to P of B. And if we have the, all the elementary events, A1 through An, then the sum over all these elementary events is equal to 1. 
Um, I mean, we call this the normalization condition because the sum over all probabilities for all elementary events always is 1. So the, uh, the sum of the probabilities is normalized to 1. Okay, now let's talk about uh, probability distribution, the cho or often called the joint probability distribution for two variables. I have two variables, A and B, and now we use the notion uh, the bold phase P stands for the whole probability and the not bold phase P just stands for P of A B or P of A not B and as you can see here we have all combinations of A and B positive and negative yeah? and uh, we, here we have four combinations so the, the probability distribution is the vector containing all uh, four combinations of these two variables or we can of course write this in matrix form and then the probability distribution consists of these four entries and I have this tabular B equal true and false and A equal true and false all four combinations. Okay. Um, yeah, and also, uh, of course, I should say what this means, A comma B. A comma B is just a shorthand for A and B. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, now um, to make it a little bit more general, if we have d different variables, x1 through xd, and each of these variables can have n values, then the distribution contains values like x1 equal to x1 up to xd equal, uh, so the, the, the capital uh, variable uh, or the, the capital letter x1 is the name of the variable and the lower case x1 is the value of the variable. Yeah? Okay, so this variable x1 can have n different values. That's what we see here. And the whole thing creates, uh, let's go back to the example. Here we have a two-dimensional matrix because we have um, two variables. Huh? If we have d variables, we, have, we get a d-dimensional matrix with n to the power d elements in the matrix. And now, um, it's important to note that one out of these n to the power d variables is redundant. So in order to get full knowledge, go here to this example. In order to have full knowledge about our world, I only need three of these four entries in the matrix. Why? Why is one of these guys redundant? Because the sum is one. Yeah. Because the sum of all these four guys has to be 1. And if I know this condition, I of course can derive this one missing value. Huh? It's just 1 minus the sum of the others. Um, yeah, let's look at a nice little example. So, um, yeah, this is about uh, students speeding in the Dockendroidstrasse. Huh? Uh, not only students, other people are speeding too. I mean, this is uh, 30 kilometers per hour uh, street. Um, and now suppose we have such a radar measurement here in the Dockenriedstraße and we do uh, some measurements. Yeah? Like um, we observe 100 vehicles and uh, then out of these 100 vehicles, in 30 cases, the driver was a student. And also out of these 100 vehicles, in 10 cases, 
um, the velocity was too high and in five cases there was a student with too high velocity. Okay. And now the, the interesting question is, for example, do students speed more frequently than the average person or than a non-student? Huh? And the answer can easily be given by using a conditional probability. Huh? So P of V under the condition S. So that means probability for velocity too high under the condition driver is a student. And this is of course the ratio of, of, these, uh, of these two numbers. The number of drivers that are student and are too fast divided by the number of student drivers. Okay, and now we take these uh, figures out of the tabular, which is 5 here over 30, which is 1 over 6. It's about 17%. Huh? Um, okay, and now we also can see from our tabular that the probability for velocity too high is 10 over 100, which is 0.1. Uh, so this is the average probability over all the drivers. So what we can conclude from this is that the probability for a student to drive too fast is higher than the probability for an average driver to, uh, to be too fast. Of course this is not a true measurement. I just uh, put some numbers in here. Okay, so that's a nice example about conditional probabilities. And now here we have the definition of conditional probability. So P of A given B is P of A and B divided uh, by P of B. Yeah? Um, yeah. And now, um, I mean, this is just the ratio of two probabilities. And we can write this as the cardinality of the set A and B divided by the cardinality of the set B. Why can we do this? Here is the proof. Um, we just take the definition of the probability P of A and B and P of A and B is by this Laplacian definition uh, the size of A and B divided by the size of omega and this is divided by the size of B divided by the size of omega and as you can see easily omega cancels out and we get the result. Okay. Now, this is a very important definition we will use very often in the future. We call two events independent, events A and B independent, if P of A given B is equal to P of A. I mean, this is quite intuitive because this tells us that in order to know the probability for A, it does not matter whether I know B or not. This is the probability for A with no knowledge about B. This is the probability for A given B. And if these two uh, numbers are independent, uh, no, sorry, if these two numbers are the same, then we call the two events independent. Huh? And now from this uh, definition we immediately get uh, this conclusion which means P of A and B is equal to P of A times P of B. Now I ask you for the proof of this little theorem which is really very easy. It's as easy as it can be. Who 
Who wants to come to the board and write down this proof? What is your first step you always do when you want to find a proof? You remember the definitions of the terms involved in the theorem. Now, I guess this theorem is about conditional probabilities. So now what about if we write down the conditional probability P of A given B, which is P of A and B divided by P of B. That's the definition of this conditional probability. Huh? Okay, and now our definition of independent tells us that this has to be equal to P of A. I hope you now see the proof. I mean, what, what, what do we do next? We bring this P of B to the right and that's it. And now we have this conclusion. Um, yeah. So you see, these two propositions are equivalent. Many people use this as the definition of independence of two variables and then from this easily to derive this. So it doesn't matter whether you define it in this way or in that way. But I defined it like that because for our, for our AI applications here, this, I would say this is more intuitive. Because, as I already explained it, the knowledge of B does not help us to know the probability of A. Okay, let's look at an example. We take our uh, uh, dice game again. The probability for two sixes in, in uh, rolling two dice um, is 1 over 36. And why is it 1 over 36? Because the probability for dice 1 equal a 6 and dice 2 equal a 6, 2 is the, just a product of these two probabilities which is 1 over 36. But I mean it's very important uh, to make clear that this is not always the case. This is the case only if the, the events are independent. Huh? Now let's, uh, let's assume that our die number 2 always comes out the same as die number 1 due to some magic uh, background. Suppose, suppose we take some bigger dies like that size. Huh? And then I throw the die number one, it comes out with some number and inside there is some electronics and uh, uh, with some uh, wireless connection, this die number one tells die number two, I've, I am now a three and you, uh, you should try to be a three too. So I throw die number two and die number two inside has some mechanics so it can move some masses around such that with high probability it uh, will be a three. Then of course these guys are no longer independent and in the extreme case if die two always comes out as die, like die number one then it's just one over six. Okay. Um, yes, so now we, we will need the chain rule which is uh, uh, let's say a simple generalization 
of the definition of conditional probabilities. Look here. Here we have the definition. If we multiply this P of B to the left, then we get this equation. Huh? So P of A and B is P of A given B times P of B. Huh? So we will use the definition pretty often in this form. And now look at this um, um, joint distribution. This joint distribution of n variables x1 to, uh, to xn can be written as, we, ta we take this rule, we take one variable out, xn, given all the others times, yeah, what we have here, x1 to xn minus 1. So this is the application of the product rule, the first application. Now we apply the product rule again um, to this. I mean, look, what, we, what, we, what did we do up to now? We reduced this joint distribution with n variables to a new joint distribution with one variable less, with n minus one variables. And now to this distribution, we again apply the, the product rule. We take xn minus one out here, and then I get um, yeah, conditioned on x1 to xn minus 2 and times this probability. And now we can repeat the application of the product rule until this only contains one uh, variable. And now if, I look, if we look at this, this is the product of many conditional probabilities and if, uh, if we start here, we get p of x1, p of x2 uh, given x1, then p of x3 given x1 and x2 and so on. And we can write this in this uh, formal way. This is the chain rule. Huh? Um, and now, what is it good for? I mean, this is good for if we start with a distribution, I mean this is just the end conjunction of all these variables, we can transform this into a product of conditional probabilities where we all the time have one variable conditioned on all the others. Okay, now marginal marginalization is yeah something, uh, yeah, Given a, a distribution, given the joint distribution, for example, of two variables A and B. Now, if I want to know P of A, so I want to cancel out one variable. Then P of A is P of A and B, or A and not B. Yeah? I mean, this is, we are talking about P of A. And uh, so we, we, we neglect B, so then we may have B or we ha may have not B. Huh? And now taking the definition of the or uh, conjunction, this is P of A and B plus P of A and not B. And because these two events here, they exclude each other, so we do, uh, we do not uh, have to subtract uh, the intersection of the two events. Okay, so this is the sum of these two uh, conjunctive events. Um, so what, do, what have we done here in order to get P of A? We take the sum of all values of the second variable B. Huh? the sum of B and not B. So, and in general, if we have D variables and we want to cancel out one of these D variables, we want to cancel out, we want to throw away the last variable XD. Then we have to sum over all the values of the last variable capital XD. And that's what we call marginalization. Um, 
you have an idea why it's called marginalization? You know what a margin is? Margin in German means Rand. Uh, it's the border. For example, in this room here, the margins are the walls. This wall, that wall, the floor, the ceiling, this and that wall. Uh, these are the margins. So what is the margin of a probability distribution? Um, yeah, so suppose we have a two-dimensional distribution. Variable A here and variable B here. And suppose these are binary variables with two values. So then we have 0 and 1 for both variables. So the, I mean we have these two, uh, these four um, combinations of the two variables A and B. So what we have is a square, but actually only the corners of the square. But take the square as a whole for a second. Now this is a two-dimensional set of points. And what are the margins? The margins are the edges here. So what about uh, this margin here? So this, this is what we get if we cancel out A. So P of B is throwing the whole distribution onto this margin B. Or P of A would be projecting it onto this margin A. No? That's why it's called marginalization. And now, I mean, of course, we could assume that our variables may have many different values. Then, what, are, what, what must I do to get P of B? I just have to sum over all the values of A, and that's the projection onto this margin. And if, it's, if my distribution is not two-dimensional, if it is three-dimensional, um, and I marginalize out one variable, suppose variable C in this direction, marginalization over C means computing the sum of all C values and finally it's a projection onto this plane. Yeah? And in D dimensions it means a projection on the D minus one dimensional space. That's why it's called marginalization. And we will need this pretty often because sometimes we want to cancel out one variable. Or maybe we want to cancel out two variables. If we have three dimensions, A, B, and C, then what, what must we do? First, we sum over all values of C, and then we sum over all values of, uh, of B, and then we get P of A. So we can throw out as many variables as we want of our distribution. Okay, let's, let's take a, a little example again, our appendicitis example. We have the two variables leuco, which is the leukocyte value, and appendicitis, which is the diagnosis. It's either, the, the appendix is either inflamed or not. Uh, so we have up and not up, and we have leuco and not leuco. So you see this leuco variable is a binary variable. It just tells us whether this value is bigger than 10,000 or not. Okay, and now our distribution comes with these four variables. And marginalization is nothing but computing the sum over one row. So if we sum over the appendicitis value, we get P of leuco, which is 0.54 here, or P of not leuco, which is 0.46. And uh, in the same way, we can uh, cancel out the leuco value and get, get P of appendicitis, which is 0.28 and of not appendicitis. Huh? And I mean this is just the calculation in formulas. 
Um, yeah, now let's, let's talk about the Bayes theorem, which is a very important formula too. Um, yes, so look at this. This is the definition of the conditional probability, P of A given B. And now we just take the symmetric um, conditional probability P of B given A, which is this here. The only difference is in the denominator, here we have P of A and here we have P of B. Okay. And now, what we now do is, yeah, let's do it on the blackboard. Because this is, the Bayes theorem is very important and you should be able at any time to prove this Bayes theorem and it's a trivial proof, really. So let's take these two formulas we have up there and now we just write P of A and B equal to P of A given B times P of B. How is this equality called? We just had it one slide before. It's the product rule. That's the product rule. Okay. And now, that's the product rule we derive from this. We just bring the P of B up here. And now let's apply the product rule to this formula. So we just take the P of A up here. And then we get P of um, B given A times P of A. Okay? So this equality is what we get from this. We just multiply left and right with P of A. And you see we have P of A and B equal something and P of A equal B equal something. So this is this and that. And now what we see is this left hand side is equal to this right hand side. And now we can, uh, we can solve this equation for P of B given A is equal to this P of A given B times P of B divided by P of A. And this is Bayes' theorem. Any questions about this uh, tiny proof? It's really easy. Okay, it's nice, we, we've got a new formula. Um, and this formula is very, very, very important. I mean, this is, I mean, this is the reason why um, what we will do in the future, uh, so next, in next or second next lecture, is called Bayesian networks, Bayesian decision theory, and so on. Huh? Bayesian reasoning, Bayesian AI, uh, it's all based on this formula. Why is this formula so important? Because of this. B given A here and A given B here. So this base formula allows us to flip these two variables. To flip the two variables A and B. Suppose we know P of A given B but we want to know P of B given A. Then we just use the base formula. And the base formula switches these two guys. What we need to know is these guys, they are called the priors. The prior probabilities. In German it would be a priori Wahrscheinlichkeiten. So you see, in order to flip these two, we need to know 
these two priors. Otherwise, we don't know what this is. Yeah, now let's look at an example. Let's go to the appendicitis example again. I mean, this is a very nice, uh, it's actually, I would say, uh, these medical applications, they are the nicest examples for, for the Bayes theorem. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Suppose we want to build a medical expert system. The input for the expert system would be my symptoms, like the leukocyte value, like the fever value, like the pain in the abdomen, and so on. And for, for appendicitis, there are around 15 classical symptoms. And these 15 symptoms would be the input for my expert system. Okay, so now for the moment, suppose the only one input is the leukocyte value. This is actually the most important symptom. Huh? Suppose the leukocyte value is the only input. What is my desired output? It is, of course, appendicitis. Yeah? So in order to... I mean, this actually is the, the expert system. This is the expert system. Why? Because this gives me the probability for a patient to have appendicitis if I know the leukocyte value. Yeah? So if, so this tells me, suppose this value is 0.7. Then this tells me among all the patients with increased leukocyte value, 70% have appendicitis. This is my knowledge. And now I can take a decision based on this probability. Okay. I mean, uh, about 12 years ago, we worked on such an expert system, and at the beginning I thought, okay, let's just um, get these conditional probabilities and put them into my expert system, and that's all what I need, and I'm finished. But I learned that, I learned from talking to doctors from reading books about medicine that no physician would ever write down this conditional probability in a book. Initially, I didn't know why they don't write it. I just wondered, why don't they write it in this way? And at the same time, at that time, yeah, it was 12 years ago, at that time, my kids were little. So my oldest daughter is 23 now, so it was 11 at that time. And my sons, they were even uh, younger, so they were six and seven, something like that. So they were uh, kind of little kids. And they, from time to time, had these kid diseases, like measles or a uh, cold or whatever. Huh? And we bought a book about these, my wife and me, a book about these kids' diseases. And it was a nice book, but when I read the book, I was frustrated. It was really frustrating, because what I want to know when I have this little kid, and this kid has on its abdomen uh, many red points, then I want to know, is it measles, or is it windpocken, or is it whatever it is. So I would actually expect in this book a chapter telling me about all diseases with red dots on, on the body. But there is no chapter like that in the book. Because, I mean, if I would have such a chapter, I would look into the chapter and then there would be some, some pictures and then I would say, okay, this is most similar to what my son has and now I can decide it's measles, for example. But no, the book is not structured in this way. How is the book structured? What are the chapters in the book? There is chapter 1, measles, chapter 2, windpocken, chapter 3, this, and chapter 4, that, and so on. So I would have to read the whole book in order to know what's up with my son now. 
and that's not really satisfactory. But that's how all physicians write their books and their literature. Why do they do it this way? Why don't they ever write the books in the other way around? Why is there no book about, um, about diseases in the abdomen where there is a chapter about high leukocyte value and a chapter about low leukocyte value and a chapter about this and a chapter about that? Why is there a chapter ab about appendicitis and a chapter about uh, gallbladder uh, something and whatever? Huh? Why are the chapters um, written in this way and not the other way around? Look, the chapters are written in, like in that form. What you can really read in the book is, is this value, if it's a good book. If it's a good book, you will find, uh, they will write, okay, if the patient has an inflamed appendix, then with very high probability, maybe 95%, the leukocyte value is increased. That's what they write. But that's what does not help me for my expert system. I need this guy. So I really need the base formula to get from this to that. But now again the question, why do they write their books in this stupid way which does not help me for diagnosis? Have an idea? Because there are probably 1,000 diseases um, with that you can have low leukocytes. Yes, and uh, yeah, but what, what would be the problem with this? You're right, maybe there are 1,000 because, I mean, a high leukocyte value just tells you about uh, some inflammation in your body. The inflammation may be in the appendix, but it may be in your nose, in your ears, whatever. Huh? Yes, yes, I mean, yes, it's about uh, combinations of symptoms, that's true, yes. But I mean, the book may be structured like chapter one, increased leukocyte value, and then sub-chapter one, about fever or not fever. And then at the end of this subchapter, I know, okay, if the patient has high leukocyte value but no fever, then it may be this or that or that. I mean, this would finally end up in a decision tree. You would have kind of a decision tree telling you, and that's what I would expect. I mean, I actually don't want the book. I want the decision tree. I go into the tree and then I look, okay, leukocyte value, fever, pain, right lower, and so on. And finally it tells me it's this disease. That's what I would like. But there are no decision trees in the bookstores. Uh, the reason is, uh, it's quite simple. Um, the reason is actually that there are many diseases with high leukocyte value. And now, if the book would be written in that way, then this book would not be valid in Africa. So if it would be written by Dr. Rampf here in Weingarten, the book would be valid in Weingarten today. But it would not be valid in Africa and not be valid in China or whatever, wherever. Huh? Because the climate is different, the people are different, their uh, life is different and so on. And uh, in Africa, maybe there are other diseases with a high leukocyte value, which we even don't have here. Maybe malaria is one of these. We don't have it here. So then if the patient has a high leukocyte value, then maybe with very high probability in Africa it's malaria, but not here. Huh? 
that's why this conditional probability depends on where I live. However, this conditional probability P of leuco given appendicitis, this just tells me if this person has appendicitis, then with some probability the leukocyte value is increased. And now let's assume for a moment that all people in this globe are very similar. That means this probability does not depend on the individual person, at least it does not strongly depend. So this is a universal truth. This is universal truth which is true everywhere and all the time. This is just about the model of the human body. Huh? However, this depends on where I live and when I live and how I live and so on. That's why they write this in their books, because this is universally true. And now, in order to make out of this universal truth your special, particular probability you need for your expert system, you have to put in the priors. And you see now what's relevant. The probability for appendicitis is very important. Maybe in Weingarten the probability for appendicitis is 1 over 10,000 and maybe in China it is 1 over 30,000. So it's different. So this gives you an adaptation from this value to this value you need. And also, of course, the probability for a high leukocyte value. Maybe in some tropic country in Africa where there are many uh, tropical uh, diseases or bacteria, whatever, um, maybe the probability for a high leukocyte value is by far higher than it is here in Germany. So this also adapts your conditional probability to the particular situation and then you have your expert system. Okay, so what we need is actually these universally true conditional probabilities and the priors for the particular country and then your expert system will be adapted to the particular situation. And that's very nice. Yeah? So all these three values are important. Yeah, and now look, uh, of course, um, this conditional probability, this one here, 0.82. So in case of appendicitis, uh, uh, an increased leukocyte value comes with 0.82. And now if I put in these two priors, um, then I get a 0.43, which is quite different from this. Yeah. And it's very important for us to distinguish between this and that conditional probability. Actually, in, in public relations, in TV, all the time when I watch um, advertisements in the newspapers, in TV, all the time they cheat by not distinguishing these two values. So they tell you this value and then maybe you get afraid and say, oh, oh, oh it's so dangerous, I can get appendicitis all the time. Uh, however, this is not about, uh, about the probability of getting appendicitis. This is about the probability of leukocyte value given appendicitis. But then they sell you the, the, the drug because then you are afraid of getting this disease. Huh? But this is just cheating. Um, yes. So yeah, maybe I show you um, I show you another example about how you can cheat with conditional probabilities. Let me see. So suppose you want to buy an alarm for your house. No, suppose you want to sell an alarm to somebody for his house. And now I tell you how you can cheat these people. Huh? And I tell you how they do this all the time on the Oberschwabenschau. Huh? Maybe not with alarm, but with, with whatever they want to sell you. Huh? 
So first I tell you, okay, this is a very reliable alarm that I am going to sell you. Huh? And it tells you um, with a probability of 99% every, every uh, burglar. Huh? So if there is a burglary in your house, then with 99% uh, it will tell you. Okay. I mean, this is not this is not cheated yet. Maybe that's true. Huh? Um, yeah. And 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 then, and then this is the cheating. And because of this, with very high probability, I know there is a burglary when I have the alarm. So what I do here is, I swap the two uh, variables in my conditional probability. Uh, now, yeah, and, and this, is this is false. Look, I mean, E stands for burglary, Einbruch. Huh? Let's talk about Einbruch, and it's easier to understand the E. Huh? So for the not Germans, Einbruch means burglary. So P of alarm given Einbruch, this is the probability for your alarm given there was a burglary in your house. Huh? Um, and that's actually this proposition. That's this. But now here I tell you from the alarm you can conclude on a burglary. And that's actually this guy. Probability for burglary given alarm. And now, look, um, this here is 99%, but this guy here is only 1%. And that's how they all the time cheat people. Because, I mean, if you're just talking informally, you even can't distinguish between this and that. We were just talking about burglary and high probability for alarm or the other way around. But people, if they talk informally, they don't distinguish between, between these. And then you believe that this is a good alarm, but it is an extremely bad alarm. And why is it extremely bad? Because of the priors. Because of the priors. So again, suppose this alarm is pretty reliable, so we have a 99% probability given the burglary that the alarm goes, uh, sounds. Yeah? But now, if the priors are like that, probability of alarm is 0.1. That means in one out of ten days I have an alarm in my house. I mean, this is already, if you look at this, and if, if the salesperson would tell you this, you would immediately be suspicious. Why? Why would you be suspicious if you see this? Because uh, there needs to be um, yeah, every one out of ten days. So you would ask this salesperson, where do you live? There is in one out of ten days a burglar in your house. So this may be a very dangerous place. Now the salesperson would answer, no, no, no. I'm li I live in a very safe place. What would be your next question? Where is that? It's in Weingarten. And we all agree that Weingarten is very safe. Even though there are many students, Weingarten still is very safe. Now my next question to the salesperson would be, oh, but then there must be many other, or there must be other reasons for your alarm. Huh? Maybe a cat walking around the house and then the alarm goes off every day because there are many cats around in Weingarten. Um, yeah. 
And if, if you look at this uh, figure here, which is uh, 0 0.001, this is 1 over 1,000. I mean, maybe this is realistic. In one out of 1,000 days, there is a burglary. Maybe it's even smaller. Maybe it's even uh, 1 over 10,000. Yeah? So this is kind of realistic. But this is unrealistic. Um, yes, so... Um, yeah, so this comes because... So, to get such a high probability of an alarm, even though burglary is very, very seldom, there must be, so this must be multiplied by a factor of 100 to come to this. Because there are other reasons for an alarm. Huh? And that means your alarm device is not very selective. So your alarm device goes off all the time, even if the cat walks around, whatever, somebody is on the street close to your house or whatever. So that's what you do not want from an alarm. And that's why finally you get this 0.99 times this 1 over 1000 divided by 1 tenth, and this gives you 0 0.01. So that means finally if your alarm goes off, you can just continue sleeping because you know, oh, it's the cat of the neighbor again. Yeah? And yeah, so this alarm is not really very helpful. But you see it makes a, a very big difference whether you talk about this or about that. And that's what these guys in advertisements, in PR, just uh, neglect. Yeah? Problems that they neglect the probability of the alarm. That's too high. Yes, I mean they, they just they just give you this figure and then they they conclude that this is the same. Huh? So be careful, be careful, be critical, and you know about conditional probabilities. So maybe next time on the Oberschwabenschau you ask this guy what is this and what is that. Uh, of course, then immediately he won't understand you anymore huh? because he just can maybe read uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ad flyer of the product or maybe only apply his software. I mean that's, that's all the time when I talk to insurance people and they want to sell me something or banking people. They use their software on the PC, type in some, some numbers and then they get the result and then, and then I start computing it and I tell him, oh but your interest rate is not as what you said, it is only 2%. And, and then he doesn't understand anymore and that's it. Yeah. Okay, let's go back uh, to uh, the AI slides. So now maybe I hope uh, now you understood a little bit why Bayes' theorem is very important. I mean it's like, it's almost like magic, especially if, if you, you're on the Oberschwabenschau, then it's really magic. Huh? Um, but here it's, it's a very powerful means to get from these universally true conditional probabilities to the swapped conditional probability, and that's the one we need in our application. Okay, yeah. And we will, we will next time start with the maximum entropy method which is a very powerful calculus for reasoning under uncertainty. So we have uncertain information like 99% of the birds can fly um, and also under incomplete knowledge. Often we don't have the knowledge. Maybe we even know nothing but we have to take a decision. Or maybe we know a little bit, uh, but not everything we need. You already know, if you do probabilistic reasoning, what you would need to know. 
suppose we have this variable appendicitis and 15 symptom variables then we all together have 16 variables what do you need to answer any question about this scenario of appendicitis so we have these 16 variables what do you need so what would be the ideal amount of information you need in order to answer any question you would need to know the joint distribution this is a 16 dimensional distribution involving many many numbers but if you would have the whole distribution then you could uh, compute everything yeah? you, you have the full information then you can compute conditional probabilities you could do marginalization you could for example out of this 16 di dimensional distribution uh, compute probability for appendicitis you could compute probability for high leukocyte value whatever yeah? so you need the full distribution uh, and this distribution involves many many numbers in case of only two binary variables the distribution contains four numbers but only three out of these four are independent so you would need to know three of these four values but what happens if you know only two of them then classical mathematics statistics would say oh no you can't uh, draw any conclusions huh? you have incomplete information so you, you better get these missing values and then I can draw a conclusion but that's let me go back to this picture here where was it this one this picture I mean if you have only two values when you need three then mathematics would tell you let's just sit back and get this missing value but you will be eaten before you get this missing value so you have to take a decision even though many values are missing and that's what we can do with the maximum entropy method that's a really nice method no matter how much you know you can get a conclusion but of course if you know nothing your conclusion will not be as good as if you know everything I mean this is simple too if you know all the values of all the variables then of course your decision is better than if you know nothing but if you're in such a situation it's better to take any decision I mean if this guy does nothing just sitting around he will be eaten five minutes later maybe five seconds maybe half a second later yeah? so he'd better take a decision as fast as possible based on the knowledge this guy has yeah? and yeah next time I will show you a very nice formalism which in all cases gives you the best conclusion based on the knowledge you have at the moment okay thank you